looking at Sefer Agada and continuing the story of Moshe, this is on, on page 46, and here the Midrash deals with, uh, with uh, Moshe going to visit to see what uh, the Israelites are doing, what his brethren are doing. So uh, here the Midrash really uh, highlights the empathy that Moshe felt towards the people. And this is, before we go to the Midrash, when you look at the Pasuk, when you look at the, at the, at the text, and we ask, what, is, what was the special quality that for which Moshe was chosen to become the messenger, to go to Paro and to talk to Bnei Israel and to get the people out of Egypt. Moshe himself questions that. He says, why, why send me, send anyone you want, right? And uh, the reason that Moshe said that when, when he's being appointed, you, you are appointed to the most coveted uh, position ever, right? One might say, right? Hashem says, you are going to be the redeemer. You are going to... Uh, to uh, take Bnei Israel out of the, out of the house of bondage, how can you say no? How can you say Shelachna? <laughs> Eventually, he says Shelachna beat Tishlah. Send whomever you want. We will get there. But the whole this whole negotiation between Moshe and, and Hashem, Moshe says, "I'm not the right person. I'm not. Uh, I'm not a politician. I'm. You know, I don't know what to tell them, etc., etc." Eventually, they get to the point where where Hashem explains to Moshe that. The, the exodus is going to be a miracle. It's going to be mir- miraculous. You don't have to do anything. I will, uh, I will plague the Egyptians, and then I will turn Paro uh, around for him to be willing to let you go, and then the Israelites will want to leave, etc., etc. So Moshe says, if it's all a miracle, why do you need me? You are doing everything. What you need is a, you need is a figurehead, is a spokesperson, I have no special uh, qualifications for the job. It's all you. I'm not uh, uh, I'm like a poster boy, right? But not, not someone who has any real role in this whole thing. And Hashem, Hashem uh, insists, God insists with him that he is the one who should go because if we roll back to the first encounter of Moshe with Bnei Israel, it's what the Midrash speaks about now. He goes out to his brother and he sees their suffering. And when he sees this uh, altercation between the Egyptian and, and the Hebrew man, he kills the Egyptian. Why is he doing that? It's not just to save that uh, particular slave. He wants to create an uprising. He wants to get everybody up in arms, fight against their, uh, their guards or their taskmasters, and leave the country. He knows that Hashem said, that God said that he's going to deliver Bnei Israel. He heard the stories from his mother. He knew it, you know, from, from childhood. And he goes out, and him personally, Moshe, as someone who grew up in the palace, has this quality of being independent, of being uh, confident. He did not go as a slave. So he's the one who could come and tell the slaves, do you realize that you are hundreds of thousands of people controlled by few guards? And Back then, those guards did not have uh, lethal weapons that could kill hundreds or thousands at once. So he says, all, all, it, all it takes is for you to get up and just mow them down and, and get out of the country. What do they answer? They say, Misam Khali, on the second day, when he tries to, to promote this rebellion, they say, Misam Khali, Ishsal Mishofet Aleinu. He says, who, who appointed you, who appointed you a, a person of authority or a judge over us? We don't need that. When they say we don't need that, they mean we are comfortable with, this, with the situation, situation as it is. We are complacent. Some of us have, that they tell him, some of us have better positions within this uh, status of slavery and, and torture, and we enjoy that. And we don't want to risk that by confronting the king or confronting the Egyptians. So we say we don't, we'd rather not lose anything uh, then risk something for the possibility of achieve much greater uh, comfort and freedom. When Moshe sees this, he runs away. I mean, because Paro also wants to kill him, but he gives up on them. He says, okay, they're not interested. There's nothing we can do. God will deliver them on his own terms when the time comes. So when, when God talks to him and he says, it's about time for you to go and deliver Bnei Salim he says, ah, atishla. send whomever you want. You don't need me. You can send anyone. And Hashem answers that even though everything is going to be conducted through miracles, still the person who leads the effort should be someone who really cares. Even when Hashem operates through miracles, the agent 
should be someone who has a special qualification. In this case, it's Moshe's empathy and compassion and, and actually passion for Bnei Israel to save them. That's why he's able later on to come and argue with God. Why did you do this to them? Or when they, uh, when they fault him, even the Israelites, when they, when, they, when they do wrong, the golden calf, etc., to come to, to, to God and say, you, you still have to uh, protect them and save them. So when we look at the Midrash, the Midrash says, so literally it means he saw their suffering. But the Midrash says it's not a superficial concept, just describing the act of seeing something, but rather it's a deeper insight. Meaning he really uh, commiserates with them and he cries with them and he says, I wish I, I would be able to sacrifice my life for you, and he would actually. Uh, and he would actually, uh, when we say, he would, he would share the burden with them. He would try to help them carry and work and do whatever is needed. So here the Midrash really points out that Moshe is a, is a very uh, compassionate and, uh, and he commiserates with Israel. Rabbi Lazar ben Oshel Rabbi Yudai Gili Omer, Ra'a Masa Gadol al Katan, Umasa Katan al Gadol, Umasa Isha al Isha, Umasa Isha al Ish, Umasa Zaken al Bahur, Umasa Bahu al Zaken. This is uh, following the Midrash that, that uh, uh, previously explains that the torture or the, or the hard labor that the Egyptians forced, the forced labor that the Egyptians put on the, uh, on the Israelites as giving people uh, a role or a, or a task that is not fitting to their, uh, to their strength or their, uh, or their skills. So they say uh, a burden that was fit for an older person or a, big, or a bigger person was given to a smaller person. And one that was supposed to be given to an old man was given to a young man. A woman and a man, all these were, uh, were exchanged. So one, now one, when, when you read that, you say, okay, if, if we ask a, uh, an older man to carry the burden that usually a young man would carry, we understand that this is a burden. But if we ask a young man to carry a burden that is fit for an older man, which is lighter, why is it, why is it uh, uh, forced labor? You should be happy with that, right? The answer is that once they are all in, uh, they're all in the same uh, trouble of being slaves, one of two things can happen. Either that the, the one who's asked to do less than what he can do is suffering because he sees the other person. He says, if we just would have exchanged our, 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 our burdens, I would be able to carry that and that person wouldn't suffer so much. So they cause this uh, angst, this real suffering to the people. That, is, that, is, that could happen with one group of people. Like what Moshe here is saying, I wish I could have done that, but they don't let him do that. Um, you know, like a scene that someone is trying to, to run and help someone and they hold him back, it's exactly that. So this is the one, one type of, uh, of problem that they created. The other problem that they created is the opposite, where the people who were given uh, a lesser burden, like the men who had to carry women's burden or uh, young men who had to carry old men's burden, would be happy with that. They say, okay, you know, it works for us. And this way they created alienation between the groups where, the, where those who get an easier job are happy with the situation as it is, even if it's still a little difficult, and they don't want it to change. So they create uh, uh, the cause of selfishness. Each one uh, cares only about his own, his own um, interest. But what Moshe would do, Vaya Mania Dargon Shelo, Vulehu Meshevlem Sivlotem, Vosek Ilu, Messiah Le Faro. So Moshe would uh, put aside his dragon, which is Mishmeret, the guard, this is a Roman word, the, uh, the, uh, the royal guards that uh, was there to assist him. And he would say, No, you wait here, let me go and do something. And he would come, and with his uh, authority, as the prince, as someone from the royal court, he would, uh, he would uh, fix the situation, would make each one carry and do what they can do to, to eliminate this kind of uh, uh, emotional distress <laughs> on one end 
and selfishness and alienation on the other hand. Amar HaKadosh Baruch Hu, אתה הנחת עסקיך והלכת לראות בצערם של ישראל ונהגת בהם מנהג אחים, אני מניח את העליונים ואת התחתונים ואדבר עמך. השם says, you know, you show that uh, commitment to your brethren, that you put, you put aside all your royal affairs. Moshe doesn't need that, he could live comfortably in the palace, he could go with one of the delegations that uh, the pharaohs used to send down the Nile into Africa, into other countries, to bring goods. Why, why does he need that? Why does he need to mingle with the slaves and, and work hard um, and uh, commiserate with them? A lot of people prefer to mask, mask the pain, to be in the bliss of ignorance. I don't know what's going on. I cannot change the situation. God says, you care? You're engaged? So I'm going to engage with you. I'm going to, to leave my affairs, which is like running the world, the heaven and earth, and come talk to you. <clears throat> דבר אחר, וירא בסבלותם, ראה שאין להם מנוחה, ואמר לפרעה, מי שיש לו עבד, אם אינו נח יום אחד בשבוע, הוא מת. ואלו עבדיך, אין אתה מניח להם יום אחד בשבוע, הם מתים. So, this is a, an interesting concept that the Midrash brings up. Of course, there's no evidence for that in the Pasuk. But the Moshe is maybe the, you could say, the first union leader uh, asking for laborers' rights. And he comes to Moshe, to, to Paro, and he argues, and he says, if you, uh, you own slaves, if you're going to work them seven days a week, they're going to die eventually. For your own sake, for your own sake, you have to give them one day off, and then they will be more productive during the week, and you will have them for longer. So it's an inter- interesting twist that the Midrash gives us here, tells us that Uh, again, it's the, the concept of being selfish or altruistic. That sometimes to achieve a goal, even though Moshe really cares about, in this, in this uh, uh, Midrash, in this story, he cares about the well-being of his brethren, the slaves. If he comes to, uh, you know that if he comes to Pao and he argues in their favor, Pao would say, I don't care. They will die, I'll replace them with others. But, Uh, Moshe says, for your sake, that, you know, long-term planning, it's better for you to have skilled workers. If they die, you'll have to get new people and train them. It's better for you to, take, to give them a day off to make them more productive. So the, uh, the argument is, in a way, it's like <clears throat> today in modern society, the marketing ideas and, and, and discussions are always guided by the concept of the called with him. What's in it for me? Right, so that's why when you uh, when you go in, when you go into the park and it says the the park is yours, keep it clean. You could say the park is the park belongs to everyone. Think about others, and uh, and uh, that might have worked also. But it, the people, the administrators realize it's better to say it's better for you to do it. Right, the the lavatory on the plane. So right, think of the. Uh, Either they say, think of the comfort of other people, or they will say, other people cared about you and left it like that. So uh, this is what Moshe does here. But again, the, the, the main cause of the Midrash is that Moshe is engaged and, and caring uh, for the Israelites. Um, the, uh, and then we get to the, to the situation where he uh, actually kills the Egyptians. Vayar ve'ivin kovacho, vayar kien ish. There are different explanations on what happened here. Vayaki and Ish. He says he saw that there was no one there. So one explanation is, again, this is the, the, the Pshar of the Pasuk. The literal meaning would be, he saw that there are no other uh, Egyptian taskmasters who, or, or uh, officials who could uh, reveal his actions to the government. Or he saw that there's no one there to take action. כי אין איש, זה the way חכמים, the rabbis say later on בפרקי אבות, במקום שאין אנשים, ישתדל להיות איש. In a place where there are no men, you be the man, in the sense of you take action, you rise to the task. So he rose to the task to take the law uh, into his hands. So either that, either there were, there were no Egyptians there, or there were no Israelites who would do something. The Midrash takes it in a different direction, and he says... He looked into it with, with the divine uh, vision or prophecy. 
He looked into the future to see whether something good will come out of this man. Otherwise, he would not have killed him. Once they saw Ki and Ish, nothing, no one, no one good is going to come, is going to be born out of the man. He killed him. But this is a very problematic concept. It's an extremely problematic concept uh, that uh, you would say, so what if that person, you know, uh, first of all, we, we're, we're going into determinism. Like we know for sure what is going to happen in the future. We can never know that. This is similar to the question if, uh, if, you, would have, if you would have run into Hitler when he was a baby, right, and you knew exactly who he was going to grow up to be, would you kill him or not? Which is not, we're not going to go into that question. Uh, but another interesting concept that Midrash says here uh, is that how did he kill the Egyptian? So the, 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 uh, the Torah doesn't say, it says, et amitzri, bachol. He struck the Egyptian. The word vayach from lehakot is to strike. So it could have been, could have been, if uh, just, uh, he just used his hands. Could have been if Moshe was powerful, you know, and living in the palace, probably would uh, be able to hit the gym, you know, a couple of days, a couple of hours a day. So, uh, and train up. This this was part of the royal life. Was to be uh, to, to, to train in the martial arts and, and riding horses, whatever it was. Or that as a prince, he had a sword. And lakot is also uh, when you use a sword. It, we use the word vayach lakot baherem. He struck him. However, the midrash says that on the following day, when he when he uh, spoke to the uh, Israelites who were fighting with each other, and he said, "Why are you fighting?" One of them replied. And said, Are you saying you're going to kill me? So they said, Oh, they said the word saying. And uh, on that, the Midrash comments, he killed him by talking. And that's why the Israelite man says, Oh, you, you're going to kill me with your words the same way you killed the Egyptian. What is the meaning of that? They say, He uttered the, <coughs> the name of Hashem. Which one is not allowed to, to say? Only someone at the level of Moshe who was a prophet, and by using that name, he killed the Egyptian. Um, which is very strange. True? I mean, just smiling. But it is strange. Why would the, why would the Midrash go to, to say that uh, Moshe killed the Egyptian using, using some like magical or, or mystical words when the Torah says clearly, he struck him. Right, which means either a physical blow or a sword. Now, why this uh, really on the thread, the word Vayomir, that Leorgenia uh, Taomir, to say that he did it by verbalizing a certain word? The answer is like we've seen before when we speak about the Midrash. The Midrash is written at a very critical time for the, for the, for, for the Jews. By the time the Midrash is written, we're not Israelites anymore. We're Jews, the children of Yehuda, because the other ten tribes were exiled. The Jews live in Israel under the, uh, the heel of the Romans. Destruction, exile. They don't really have anything they can do except for praying to God. That only that where they come to the point where the sword or physical prowess doesn't help. They try to rebel against the Romans. They, they crush them. So now the rabbis are trying to, to give people hope by saying, eventually we will survive with the power of the word. This is the way we can fight against the, uh, the Romans. Even if you don't see them dead right now, eventually, and it did, it did work. With our, whatever uh, we incorporate, our learning and our praying and all that, this is how the, the Jews were able to overcome or to survive through the crisis of the Roman Empire and get uh, to where we are today. So uh, this is the, sort of the uplifting message that is all uh, what can be found throughout the Midrashim. On, uh, especially on, on Bereshit and, and Shemot, all the interactions between Jews and non-Jews, will find that concept of the power of the word, al uh, that Yaakov, your, your power, your strength, is with your mouth, praying and learning. <laughs>